Good afternoon. I'll call the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Uh, Chair Galvin, I'm going to do the roll call for our clerk um, because she's lost her voice. <laughs> so, Chair Galvin? Here. Vice Chair Ononi? Here. Board Member Badenfort? Board Member Bannister? Here. Board Member Dowd? Here. Board Member Grable? Here. Board Member Mullen? Here. Any statements of abstention by board members? Under current policy, I don't think I need to abstain unless there's some corrections made to the minutes, but I wasn't in attendance at that particular meeting. Thank you. Item four is the approval of the minutes. So the minutes from September 20th will be approved and ordered. We have a couple of staff briefing, 5.1. The first one is on the public contract bidding environment update. Director Hornstein. This item is a follow-up from the discussion that the board had at the, with staff at the last meeting to provide some additional information regarding the bid environment. Um, Deputy Director Urbanic is gonna be presenting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hornstein and board members. Uh, Chair Galvin, board members, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and it's always good to see all of you. Um, I do wanna thank you, um, board member Matt Mullen, for the very good questions that you asked of us at the last meeting and that was sort of echoed by the rest of the board. It did give us a, an opportunity to take a pause and to really look at the information and the data to try to answer some of your questions. So we're here this afternoon to um, present the information that we found and subsequently to the last board meeting. So um, I'll get started. <clears throat> So we'll start with a, a very brief overview of our bidding platform, which is currently Planet Bids. Um, we'll talk a little bit about and show the results from other communities that we interviewed and gained information from. And then we'll look at specifically the bidding climate uh, here in Santa Rosa. So Planet Bids is our electronic platform. We started using this system in 2016. It's used by a significant number of agencies here in California, and it displays all forms of public bidding opportunities um, for goods and services, for professional services, and for public works contracts. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of what a viewer would look, uh, would see when they open Planet Bids. And um, anyone can access this information and view this list. You'd have to be registered with Planet Bids as a vendor to then select a product and um, identify what projects you may be interested in and then to actually see the specifications or the proposals as they may exist. So when a vendor does um, log in and select a particular project that they're interested in and they view um, the plans and specifications if it happens to be a construction contract, um, their information is placed on what we used to call the plan holders list and they're identified as a prospective bidder. And you may recall that term being used in previous meetings. So I just wanted to give you a really high level overview of what that, um, that electronic um, format looks like and have an understanding of if we use language that we haven't defined before. So it's uh, pretty, um, pretty new for us, but before we used this electronic platform, we were advertising in the Press Democrat and on the Builders Exchange. And um, that'll be interesting as we look at some data that I'll present further in the um, presentation. So um, to try to identify what's going on in our current climate, there were some questions and in fact, maybe some assumptions on our part on um, how the climate was being affected, the bidding climate was being affected by the fires and whether or not it is. So to try to identify that, we a number of questions came up. Um, uh, how many bidders are we getting versus what the engineer's estimate is? Um, you know, have we reached out to other communities to find out what's going on in their climate? 
and then we'll talk a little bit specifically about um, our history, and then we'll take a deeper dive into sub-regional projects, um, primarily because that was the topic of the item that sort of initiated this analysis. So this chart here is, represents all the bids that we have received from January of 2015 through um, this month, October of 2018. And it compares the engineer's estimate dollar value um, with the number of bids received. And it's kind of interesting if you look towards your upper um, right hand corner, you'll see that we had one project um, where the engineer's estimate was exceeded $12 million and we received seven bids. I think we would all pretty much expect something like that. A large project, um, people are interested in it, and subsequently we received seven bids. Conversely, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, we had a very low dollar value project and received eight bids. So that was about a $300,000 um, engineer's estimate and we received eight bids. So if you just look at that, um, maybe those two items cancel each other out and you have to look at the, the bulk of the information. And the takeaway here is fundamentally, um, we're receiving between three and four bids on almost all the majority of the other projects. So I thought that was rather interesting. When we reached out to several other of our local communities, um, Contra Costa Sanitation District, um, Fairfield, Vacaville, Rona Park, and uh, Petaluma, we also reached out to Sacramento. And um, that's a lot of agencies, and you'll recognize that there's not a lot of data points on this, on this graph. Um, but what we're comparing here is the engineer's estimate and the difference between the engineer's estimate and the low bid that was received. Um, the zero line obviously represents the engineer's estimate and above or below that uh, represents the bid result. Um, again, I would caution from making too many um, conclusions about this just because it's not a complete data record and if you were gonna take anything away from this, you could just probably look and see that the majority of these bids um, were below the engineer's estimate. And here's the same graphic with respect to um, all the bidding activity that has occurred in the same time frame that I mentioned earlier from January 2015 through October of 2018. And I must say that this um, particular chart, um, the colors don't represent anything except the different years. Um, it shows the engineer's estimate as the zero line and then if the low bid received was under or over that um, engineer's estimate by what percent. Um, I think that I expected and our group expected that we would see sort of an increase in the 2018 sort of an upward trend. Um, but that didn't show up. And uh, the majority of each year from 2015 pretty much has the same pattern as it did the year before, um, which we can start to make some conclusions about that. And um, it shows that our bidding methodology is consistent. Um, it does show that the majority of our bid results are higher than the engineer's estimate. And again, here we have a couple of outliers that are up around 140% over the engineer's estimate if you look at the top of the graph. And um, that range, I would call the outliers probably from 80 to 140 excessive. Um, but what it doesn't show is that there's any indication that there's a difference in the activity or engineers, the way we have been um, estimating our projects and the influence in the industry due to the fires. With this representation, it's not showing that that is, um, has changed. So we're gonna take a little bit of a drill down here and I think this information will help provide some clarity um, on what the bidding activity is out at the treatment plant specifically. 
Um, this is the same information that was provided on the previous graph. We're looking again at the percent over or under run of the engineer's estimate. And um, we've put information, the specific project information, so we could see if there were any um, distinctions that we could make. And what you'll notice about this graph is um, there are three projects up there that are significantly higher, or excuse me, two projects up there that are significantly higher than the engineer's estimate. One um, being nearly 120% over the engineer's estimate and the other at 80%. So we asked ourselves what's going on with those two projects. One of them was a very low bid, um, a very low bid of um, estimate of $105,000 and it was pretty unique. Um, it had to do with an expansion of the maintenance building out at the treatment plant. Um, staff received that bid and made the recommendation to the board to reject all bids. Um, the same story was true on another project, if you look to the left, that was 80% over, and that project was to do um, a biosolids repair, and that repair had to do with the the roof at the biosolids facility and the bid that came in was considerably higher than the engineer's estimate. In fact, it got so close to what it would cost us to replace the entire structure that staff made the recommendation to reject all bids to the board and the board agreed and rejected all bids and staff subsequently did minor repairs to that structure. Um, again, there's another bid that was rejected so if you take out sort of the top three high bids in this analysis over, over the past three years of all the bids that have been presented to the, the board regarding um, sub-regional projects, we start to get a more normalized look at what's going on. We also start to have a better graphic display of the variability of the type of project that, um, that occurs out at the treatment plant, which may explain some of the variability. But also what it really shows is that staff takes a look at each project on an individual basis and um, tries to provide the board with enough information to make um, good decisions about whether to move forward with a bid or not. And um, in many cases, when the bids don't make sense, staff will make a recommendation to the board so to reject all bids. The bid that was in question at the last um, meeting has to do with the digester gas improvements. And so staff went through a thorough evaluation on the merits of, of the project, much like we did on other projects. And in this case, made a recommendation for the board to approve the project. Um, but if we sort of take those aside, it, the majority of the bids that are coming in are within plus or minus 20% of the engineer's estimate. So that's sort of the end of my presentation and I do appreciate the questions that were asked and I think what we have learned, what I have learned um, specifically is that we wanna reach out to those other communities and get a more complete understanding of what, um, how they're processing their bids and what information they use um, before we make sort of any changes to how we analyze bids. We did have conversations with many of our consultant engineers who have prepared the bids in the past and in particular this last one, and they stand by their estimate. So if there's a takeaway for me, I think we're seeing some, some market pricing that goes on. And um, when we ask questions of our engineering staff and ask them to um, review and analyze their engineer's estimate that they are using current pricing from um, similar projects. So we feel like our estimates are, are valid. And what we're seeing is the market when we see these um, variabilities enter in with high bids. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bannock. Board Member Dowd. Uh, Chairman Galvin, that indicates questions, but I think my questions really would now go into item 6.2, which is on the consent 
calendar, so I, I will reserve that, but please keep in mind that I wish to remove 6.2 from the consent calendar so we can ask further questions. Board Member Grable. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, especially um, just showing us where engineers' estimates lie in, in the recent past history of RFPs and bidding. Um, I did want to clarify that one of my sort of requests and questions at the last meeting was to see uh, how we were, you know, I wanted to see a comparative analysis of, of our uh, bidding, uh, RFP response rate to other uh, communities in California, other cities like size, uh, other water departments, so I could see, you know, is, is, is this a condition of in, in the industry right now? Is it is it across um, all cities in this sector, or are we somehow, you know, unattractive to uh, responses from uh, contractors that are specifically operating um, in this sector? You know, that's a it's a good question, and it's somewhat complicated. Um, as I mentioned, we, we did reach out to other communities to try to understand sort of what's going on, and we will check back in. If we're talking about a, and if I misunderstand your question, please feel free to, to correct me and get me back to the point. If we wanna do an analysis on a specific um, sector of the industry on why our bidding climate is the same or different from other communities, that would require a considerable amount of work and analysis. Um, what I tried to present was that our bidding climate hasn't changed in the recent four years, three to four years. It's pretty consistent. Is that um, an indication of our geographic location to major metropolitan areas? Is that because we don't have the workforce here. I mean, so it gets it gets complicated, and I'm happy to dive in and try to get that information to you. No, I, I definitely understand the complexity in the criteria and, and figuring out why that might be the case. But I was just wondering if if it was the case that uh, response rates in RFPs and by sector, I just mean in water departments in other cities. Okay. Um, in terms of us being obviously, you know, somewhat fiscally conservative with our ratepayer money, um, we, we do have a responsibility to be hawkish about that. It, for me, being able to have a sense of where we sit, just in terms of it, are we attracted to contractors to even bid on these? Because when we get one bid on a project, obviously that's that's where the concern came from mm -hmm. um, at the last meeting. So, you know, are other cities of the same size it, experiencing something like that? I don't know. I understand it's an undertaking, but even just having a, a sort of a crude insinuation uh, based on some, some anecdotal data and, or, or our communication with other departments, which I know we have some in the AACWA and other, you know, other sort of associations, um, it would be nice for me to know where we sit. If we're an outlier, well, that's a concern. If it's, if it's you know, I do have an anecdote, I, I, oh sorry. I, I just wanted to offer, I didn't mean to, um, we are, um, we have a lot on our plate, staff does, so I'm cautious of biting off too much. Of course, I'll accept a direction from the board. Um, one thing we could think about is quarterly or semi-annually taking a deeper dive into this and bringing it to the board um, just on the time frame of next meeting or, or something like that would be a, a little rough. But to, to maybe we'll think of like the next quarter, um, thinking about it and when there's available time, reaching out to some folks and trying to develop a data set that could be maintained over time, something like that, if that would work for you. Yeah, there's not there's not incredible urgency to it, except for the fact that I feel like I don't have the information to really assess, you know, whether we're doing the right thing um, with our RFPs, the way that they're designed. Our our engineers' estimates are obviously, you know, diligent. I just I just want to, see, in terms of the response to our RFPs, that's that's my concern in comparison to other uh, jurisdictions. Um, I, I would offer an anecdotal from one of our senior design engineers who's in the East Bay. 
Um, he said, when we start getting projects in that are over $10 million, you'll see um, an increase in activity on treatment plant projects. Board Member Mullen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the staff um, uh, coming back with an update and the time you spent to, to review this. I, I do appreciate uh, a couple of questions regarding your, your presentation. Um, the, the the little dots that you showed about yeah. the, the, the the bid range. I understand the cyclical nature of, of bids. Uh, you ne you probably rarely hear from us when we're under the engineer's estimate when we're making money, um, but you always hear from us when they're over. As I said <clears throat> at our last meeting, 70% over is hard to swallow. Um, and um, when we get to that item, I'll have some specific pro uh, questions about our, our process there. But the what would have been interesting to see in your comparison of uh, over and under over the last three or four years is how many of those were what I would describe as standard bids for standard equipment that everybody has access to and proprietary bids um, where it's specific, it requires specific parts that are only available from one vendor um, and how those bids uh, or negotiated prices come in versus a general bid, here's the equipment, you can get it out of any catalog or any supplier. So it would have been interesting to see that comparison between proprietary projects, where they came in in our range versus general bid projects. It's, it's just a question um, because Proprietary systems, by their nature, limits your bid opportunities and it limits your supply, and I believe it also limits your ability to control costs, uh, as a general bid does. Um, just a comment, I'm not looking for a, a response. Um, when you do your, your outreach to other communities about similar projects, um, do you does that include who have you been using for your UV work or for your screen work or replacement of uh, ponds or things, does it, does it go into that kind of depth when you do outreach with other similar agencies that have similar plants like we do? Um, what I can tell you based on discussions with our engineer on this particular project in question is that they check in with vendors on pricing um, on specialized equipment and that goes, that information is included in their engineer's estimate. Um, and we typically, it's not been my experience and maybe it's, it's a question that I need to find out if our um, consultant engineering staff are reaching out to other um, agencies on specialty equipment for pricing. And again, it's it's not just specialty, it's, it's who's doing your treatment plant work. Um, uh, on whatever, and can we get your list of who you've used in the last five years compared to who we've been using or reaching out to, uh, just to try to, to increase the players in the pool, if you will, um, is what the reason I ask that is whether, how wide a net are we casting to try to get interest in coming up here and um, doing work for us? Thank you. Board Member Bannister. So the concern was about the uh, project where we only had one bid and your data indicates on average, we usually get three or four, sometimes more. In this case, it was less. I think there's been a couple of others that we saw that only had one bid. And, I, and you indicated that this system that you're currently using, Planet Bids, was implemented in 2015. I'm just wondering if anecdotally you notice any either increase or decrease in the number of bidders upon the implementation of that system. Um, actually, I would have expected that we would see an increase in the number of bidders, but um, again, this chart here where it shows the number of bidders based on the cost of the engineer's estimate, um, all the data is from 15 to 2018. It represents the same projects that you see in the other one, and there really is not a significant change um, going out on an electronic platform versus when we just advertise locally. But this data doesn't show that because you implemented Planet Bids in 2015, we'd have to have data from 13 or 14 to make that comparison? We could certainly go back, but it doesn't appear 
on this limited data set that, that reaching out on Planet Bids has increased our bidding pool. And you're saying that just from experience because the data actually, since we, we're not making an apples to apples comparison, right? We're, not, we're only comparing Planet Bids data here. Um, we do have 2015 data here, so we have a year's worth of information from when we were advertising on um, through the Press Democrat and at the Builders Exchange. So that's a fair question. It's not an even distribution of information. I see. I thought that the Planet Bids was implemented in 2015. You're saying 2016. 16. I forgive okay. me if I misstated the date. Thank you. I misunderstood that. Any other board member questions or comments? Thank you for the clarification and the staff briefing. And we will move forward, thanks. We have two items on the consent calendar. I know board member Dowd wanted to remove 6.2 and I believe board member Mullen. Yes, uh, Mr. Request. Chair, I uh, also request that we remove uh, item 6.1 from the consent calendar, move it to the regular calendar so we can discuss it. Very good, so we'll take both of those off the consent calendar and we'll now call item 6.1, which is calling for a resolution of the waiver of competitive bidding and sole source award for purchase of the aqua screen parts. Mrs. Anino. Director Hornstein, do you want to pass 6.1 for a moment? Sure. Why don't we call the item 6.2 then, please, which is uh, continued from our October 18th meeting, contract award for the Laguna Treatment Plant digester gas conditioning improvements. I have some questions on that one. Okay. Chairman Galvin, members of the board, my name is Tracy Duena, Supervising Engineer with the Capital Projects Engineering Division. I'm here to answer your question. Board Member Dowd. Basically, I appreciate the presentation that you just gave us on the trends and with the data that you presented, I don't see trends changing greatly, which does surprise me somewhat. I also looked at your chart that showed that three different projects, if memory serves me correctly, were rejected because staff uh, or the board didn't feel comfortable with uh, awarding a contract under those terms. Um, so my two questions really are this, has, has anybody during this time since our last meeting looked to see uh, through conversations with other engineers, cities, whatever, uh, to make you consider that our in-house engineer's estimate might have been too low. That's question number one. And question number two is, is there anything at this point with this project that's driving us to do this because there's an emergency need to get this project done? Uh, those are great questions. And to answer your first question, whether or not we've done and spoke to other um, agencies and tried to determine whether our engineer's estimates are too low, um, we haven't done that part of it. And I would, like I mentioned during the presentation, um, that was a, we did our best to try to reach out and get information that we could to bring back to the board this week. That would require a little more um, work on our part, which I want to take on and sort of understand what the variabilities that they're putting into their engineer's estimate, what methodology are they using versus what the city of Santa Rosa does. I would refrain from changing artificially, increasing our estimates without some um, way to determine a better method to do that. 
And again, we did reach out to our engineer who prepared this estimate. We asked for a detailed analysis and comparison versus the contractor's bid on this particular item. And our engineer is very comfortable and supports his estimate as um, the right amount for the estimate. And what we're seeing is the market um, guiding the price of the project. To answer your second question, um, I believe that staff, as I mentioned, does a lot of homework to make sure that we're informed and bring educated decision with the to forward to the board for your consideration. There was conversations with staff from the treatment plant. And um, as we mentioned during the presentation last time, that this is a, a vital um, small part of a, a process that will ultimately, the microgrid process that will ultimately return money to the city in a cost savings form. If, if there's a desire to not award the contract now and a recommendation is, we would review our estimate and put it out as subsequent date. We would rec recognize that we would have additional cost, administrative costs to um, repackage that. Um, and um, we would potentially, no, let me withdraw that. We would delay the larger project. So in staff's opinion, we stand by our recommendation to ask the board and our recommendation is that you approve the contract. Thank you, any other board, board member Mullen? Thank you. Um, just following up to uh, board member uh, Dowd's uh, question, um, if, if the board were to decide today to reject the bid and go back to the drawing board and come back, go out to bid again and see if we can do better, is there a danger in during that time? And, and I, I would look at coming back for a start perhaps in the spring. Um, is there a danger that the plant would be in non-compliance? Um, I don't specifically know that. I could um, ask Emma, Ms. Walton to come down. She was the project manager on it and very familiar with the details. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Walton, Deputy Director, Engineering Resources. Uh, this delaying the project would not put the, uh, the, the plant in non-compliance. It would put uh, the, the equipment that we're installing on our engines, the selective catalytic reduction units that are, that are the exhaust treatment units that are gonna go on the back end of our engines, it would put them in jeopardy. So this gas conditioning project is really to protect those very expensive units that will allow us to operate our engines more freely and um, actually you know, save money on the magnitude of about a million dollars a year in electrical costs. So it, it wouldn't uh, put us in non-compliance, but it would put very expensive equipment in jeopardy. So let me, let me try it a different way. Is, so the jeopardy you're talking about, is that, does that mean we would put those pumps or that equipment that you're describing in jeopardy of failure, uh, having to be replaced? Of, of having to, the media in them to be replaced. They're very sensitive units and they're sensitive to any kind of contaminants in digester gas. So the digester gas conditioning improvements will in, um, improve the, the conditioning of our gas, make it, make it cleaner gas. So then when we burn it in our engines, it won't impact those exhaust treatment units. They're basically filters. And if we put a bunch of gunk in there, it's gonna, Mess up, must mess up the filters, and then they're very expensive to replace. Um, okay, thank you. So, relative to the to to rebidding, um, if we were to direct you to go rebid it over the winter, uh, work tends to slow down in the winter time on many projects. And, and there could be an opportunity to, to attract more bidders for doing the work in whenever we can turn this around. Um, 
in doing that, would it also be valuable to review the bid document as a part of that to see if the scope of work is something that we have, that we could massage somehow and bring it into a more um, cost effective or get it closer to the target date? Or is that a futile exercise? So two questions I guess you had. One is if we pushed out the bid later in the season. Our, our data regarding the bidding climate does not show that when we push um, projects to bid later in the season that we end up getting better um, bid, bid uh, results. It, the data just doesn't suggest that. So I don't know that that would be of benefit. Uh, the second question regarding scope. We would not recommend moving forward with a, 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 a variation on the proposed scope of the project. All the equipment that's included in this project is necessary to operate the um, microgrid and the SCR units in the future. Okay. Thank you. Board Member Grable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. I know from our tour of those big is it four Cummins units um, that very, very expensive. And I know that the, as part of the microgrid uh, project, um, basically scrubbers, right, um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the back end um, are also incredibly expensive and, and delicate. Um, on this, I'm, and pretty much everything, I trust staff's uh, due diligence in, in knowing that the scope is, necessary and technically accurate and all that. Um, my concern was more in the, again, the comparative analysis of our bidding climate versus others, but if this is going to save us money, it's going to benefit our ratepayers in the long run, and we're putting other assets at risk if we don't do it, I, I definitely support moving forward despite the fact that we have uh, one bid that's that's 70% over. Um, it seems a cost benefit and, and just trusting staff due diligence there um, behooves us. The second thing I would say is um, a question. We're getting grant funding based on the microgrid demonstration project. Is there a contingency there that we're jeopardizing? I, I remember talking about that uh, at a previous meeting. I just want to make sure that I'm I have, I'm taking that into account. Um, is there a state or federal grant involved in that that we're basically waiting on until we have completion of the demonstration project? So we have, there's two grants at play. One train is receiving a grant for the project to implement the project as a whole. Right. Uh, that This would not put that in jeopardy. Uh, the project can still move forward. The second is the grant for our continued use of the battery. It, it's a it's a bit nuanced, but um, and and that that grant would also not be in jeopardy with not installing or not doing the uh, gas conditioning upgrades. That has to do with use of our of our of the battery. Okay, component. so the, yeah, and I remember those factors from that. Those were really cool. The uh, so the primary concern then from a technical uh, perspective is jeopardizing the equipment on the other end if we don't follow through with the requisite um, scrubbing on the front end, basically. Correct. Okay. Any other board member questions or comments? Right. I would agree with board member Grable. That I'm concerned about the cost, obviously, but if we're jeopardizing those pieces of equipment and if we're delaying the implementation of a process that's gonna save us a million dollars a year, the sooner we get it done, the sooner we start saving that money. So I'm fully supportive of going forward with this. Board member Down. Um, I, I have been very uh, concerned about this project and I am glad that staff has come back and made this presentation. Uh, I concur with uh, Board Member Grable and uh, Chairman Galvin that there are some extenuating circumstances that would allow me to vote for moving this project forward with the recommendation that when staff ends up with something that doesn't fit their considered engineer's estimate before the bids are received, that you do some research uh, with other entities to back up uh, so the board has confidence that our engineer's estimates are accurate. 
and, and responsive to whatever's going on in the market. But given that, because of the things that you have just answered for me, I can support awarding this contract. Board Member Bannister. I agree with that. And what I guess I was wondering about going back to the bid process is, it seems like um, we could be more, or I guess the question is, could we be more proactive when we get a bid that's over 50% over the engineer's estimate and we only have one bid? Is there a way to reach out to other qualified contractors and ask them if they um, would be interested in uh, bidding on the project uh, or do we have to be this uh, passive about it, I guess? Um, I, I don't know that I would use the word passive. After we receive B, bids, we have an obligation to review them for responsive and responsible bids, um, unless there's a significant reason why we would or would not, and I'll um, ask Assistant uh, City Attorney uh, Ms. McLean to elaborate on some of the, the legal ramifications about um, sort of we're, we're not, we can't go out and then kind of fact verify and negotiate when we have a bid on the table. Um, there is a process to follow and some government code sections that um, frown on what could be considered shopping by a public agency. So, um, Ms. Still. Yes, thank you. Um, I did some further research um, from our last meeting on what the options are available when we are in um, this situation. Um, both our charter and the public contracts code as well as our city code, they're not in perfect alignment, but I will say um, it is clear that the, the board has two options um, initially to award to the lowest bidder or to reject all bids. And then the question is what happens after you reject all bids? Um, I caveat that by saying that if we do not receive any bids on a project um, uh, invitation, then we do have the ability to negotiate a contract for a project. However, if we receive even one bid, we must um, either accept the bid and award the contract or reject the bid. If we reject the bid, then there is some, there are some provisions, some language um, uh, that says we can, we can abandon the project or we can re-advertise for um, additional bids or go through an additional bidding process. There may also be an option, though it would have to be, I think, carefully considered and researched by staff ahead of time. The um, charter and the public contracts code do allow um, by a five-seventh vote of the board to um, reject the bids, but then also consider um, other alternatives to um, accomplish the work, um, either by its own city forces or um, through another means, and it's, again, need, would need to be elaborated by staff, but um, to, to accomplish the work. So it's, it's not something that I've seen the city do historically. Um, so quite frankly, it's something that would be a new, new um, method for us forward, but it is really clear that we have to either reject or accept initially, and then we have some limited options after the fact if we reject. Board Member Mullen. Um, I, I appreciate the staff um, clarifying the, the, the questions that we've all raised regarding this item um, and, and uh, also the candor about the impacts if we postpone it or reject it um, that it might have on the system. It, it, I, I'm really wrestling with this, as I think you could tell, um, over the fact that I, I understand the savings we're gonna generate from this project. It's very clear what those savings are. Those savings are gonna be whenever we do this project. Um, but I, I'm, we're also paying a premium. We're paying 70% over the estimate, and you just said again today, you stand by your original engineer's estimate. So you're basically asking us to pay 70% more than what you feel this project is worth. Um, and so uh, um, I'm really wrestling with that um, in the overall scheme of things, and, and I'm not a big fan of rolling the dice and hoping that our equipment will survive a three-month delay while we go rebid this thing. 
Um, it's, it's, we're, we're kind of boxed in here in that uh, th this came forward, you went through your normal process and we come back and we have one bidder and you're asking us to approve one bidder and we're kind of up against the clock here. And so we don't have a lot of wiggle room and um, it, it's just, I'm still having a hard time swallowing this. Vice Chair Arnone. I'm, I'm in line with what the comments made by uh, Board Member Grable and I'm prepared to make a motion if that's appropriate at this time. Before we make that motion, we do have just received a speaker card. Mr. DeWitt, did you want to speak to this item? A concern that I have is that when you say you're caught between a rock and a hard place, it would help the ratepayers if the packet explained why that hard place exists. The information that uh, was just brought forward today wasn't available to read here to see why it's felt by staff it's an emergency and you have to do it. And I believe that the staff is honest people, but by the same time, I don't necessarily believe without some facts that you can't wait three months. And I believe that any bid that's 70% more than the engineer has said may not be the best way to go for the rate payers. So you're basically taking one thing and balancing it and saying, okay, will our equipment break and that'll cost us more? Or can we go back out and get a more fair bid? that will cost us less in the future. I would err on the side of costing the ratepayers less and waiting those extra months. I don't believe your equipment's going to break. I believe it's been maintained probably very well by the staff and there's no emergency here in this, fa this fact sheet. This is all I have to go by. This is 6.2 up here. There's no emergency listed in here in any way, shape or form. So, to have somebody come down here today and say, well, we have to do this because it's uh, the only way we'll keep the equipment together doesn't ring true to me. And I appreciate that I'm not a fully trained engineer, but I'm uh, a mechanic that understands machines and how to do best by them. So please don't accept this bid, reject it and go back out in the future. That would be better for the rate payers, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, just for the record, the staff report does indicate um, the critical, critical nature of this particular project as it relates to the completion of the microgrid demonstration project, which is scheduled to be completed this fall. So, thank you. Board member, sure. And yeah, my other comment would be, it, from your presentation, it's also clear to me that three months is not gonna change a bidding climate. I, I would definitely love a more big picture understanding of, of that and how we measure up to other communities and what's going on maybe statewide. But to to think that after three months we're some, and, and putting a lot more staff time and resources in, putting more money into the actual RFP and achieving the same result, that to me, it would be, you know, even more wasteful uh, use of, of public funds. So I, I definitely trust your recommendation there and the data that we've been shown on the bidding that we're not magically going to fix that overnight. I think as, as Board Member Dowd Mullen said, working on that in the, in the near and long term to make sure we just kind of wrap our heads around that and figure out where we sit is, is would be totally worthwhile as we have staff time to do so. Um, but it, it, it is clear to me as well that we don't want to be putting more resources and money and staff time that frankly we don't have into achieving the exact same result, uh, you know, more, more likely than not, uh, when we also have the, um, the impending burden of the, uh, the uh, damage to equipment or, or any of those things. So thank you for being so thorough um, in, your, in your response and analysis and presentation there. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Arnone, did you want to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion that the Board of Public Utilities by motion approve the project and award construction contract number C02101, Laguna Treatment Plant Digester Gas Conditioning Improvements in the amount of $968,000 to the lowest responsible bidder, responsive bidder, uh, Pacific Infrastructure Corporation of Pleasanton, 
and authorize the total contract amount of $1,113,200. I second that motion. Motion by Vice Chair Arnone, seconded by Board Member Dowd to approve item 6.2. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes unanimously. Are we ready to go back to 6.1, Director Hornstein? <laughs> Item 6.1 is uh, looking for a resolution for a waiver of competitive bidding and sole source award for the purchase of our aqua screen parts. Deputy Director Prince will start with uh, purchasing agent Trammell next. <laughs> So there's a little ambiguity at times about who is lead on purchasing items and I think there's an interest in um, shortening the list of uh, people who staff reports are from in the future. So forgive a little bit of a hiccup there on the front end. Um, this is a procurement of some parts. I'm happy to uh, discuss any questions related to operations at the Laguna Treatment Plant with respect to this equipment. And Brandilyn Trammell is from the purchasing division. She can answer questions related to procurement of the parts. Um, with that, I'd be happy to entertain questions uh, about the staff report and um, operational aspects of the project. Thank you, board member questions or comments? Board member uh, Mullen. Thank you, um, I think I'm the one that raised this issue before, so I'll start off. Um, because again, we're dealing with proprietary equipment, um, It doesn't seem to be a standard bid process. It seems to be a negotiation. Now we can call it a lot of different things, but it, it seems to me that staff and the supplier sit down in a room and talk about what we need, and then they go back and they give us a price list. And I hope I hope you can clarify that for me. But um, so with respect to sole source products, which is what we're talking about here, there's only one supplier and it's it's not one size fits all, it's one supplier. And um, do we, as a part of that, do we sit down and say, show us your books and show us your, um, you know, like when you go buy a car, you can go in and they say, here's our invoice and we get this, uh, this amount of money over the invoice and you can drive out with that car. Do, do we do a similar thing with proprietary uh, products like this? Do we say, they pull out and say, here's our government price list. Normally, if this was a, uh, an investor-owned treatment plant or a private treatment plant, they would pay this for this product and you only pay this. Um, and we get an understanding that we're getting something because we're investing in their proprietary technology. Um, and so let me just start with that. Um, great question, thank you so much. So I would start by saying that in 2007, the city actually underwent a request for proposal for these particular products and went out and did a thorough analysis and investigation and made a determination to purchase these particular units. Um, Based on that, the ongoing um, infrastructure is then proprietary. It would have been proprietary regardless of who you chose. They're very intricate, specialized pieces of equipment. So we did a thorough analysis and made a decision. Um, they're really at the end of what they consider to be useful life. And so they had engineers come to water that are specific to Andritz and really help the staff who are the subject matter experts and provide the ongoing maintenance of the equipment on the day-to-day -day basis to really understand and digest exactly what you just asked. Um, I have spoken to staff and to Andritz and confirmed that this pricing paradigm went through at least four different versions to really understand what the best outcome was and to really fine line detail of the four units, which units needed a deeper dive as far as components and the other ones to ensure that we end up with a useful life that continues between 12 and 18 years was the estimate. Okay, thank you. Um... So we, when we do the, the price review with them, we, we walk out of there feeling that this is a fair price for the products that we're purchasing. Correct. Um, 
It's sometimes difficult, so there isn't a standard government pricing to really ad address your question. Um, we will do an ancillary search on the internet, possibly look out for other people that have similar products to ours, look for publicly available contracts. Um, you see a lot more for um, larger, more utilized systems like our Trojan UV system, where I can find other cities that may have smaller systems than ours, but I can see what how many units they purchased and what the cost were associated with their own council documentation. I also wanted to speak about something that you had said earlier around the actual language in the uh, um, award, which is which begins with this waiver of competitive bid. I want to be clear to the board that when we are certain that there is a sole source, and in this case, indeed, it's proprietary, we have documentation to that sole source. And so there is no bid. This is a nuance in language that I don't necessarily recommend as your purchasing agent, um, because I think to the general public, it's somewhat misleading. We did not waste any staff time actually proposing a bid process. We actually went directly to a negotiations process um, to really evaluate and understand not only the project approach, but what um, ancillary spares. Um, specifically, in this project, we have a lead time issue. So we wanted to make sure we have an understanding of what we need, that we can get it ordered, and then move forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, I my, my last question is just more of a, a general question about proprietary products. And, and again, uh, fr from afar, I've watched the, the treatment plant expand over the last 20 years, and it's it's fantastic. It's an award-winning plant uh, recognized uh, on many different levels across the country and in through the industry. Is um, but when you when you invest in proprietary project products, as I said last time, you're married, but you can never get divorced because it becomes almost cost prohibitive. So in our, as we move forward, do we ever, as a part of our long planning for repair or replacement of products, ever look at trying to migrate away from proprietary products and look at the latest technology that somebody else may have invented um, that perhaps is either more standardized or more available from other uses, knowing full well what the cost would be to take out the proprietary stuff and bring in a different type of technology. Um, if I may answer that question, um, generally yes. However, there are certain treatment processes at the plant that will most likely always requires some sort of proprietary equipment. Now, proprietary equipment does eventually wear out. These components that are in this particular uh, item are components of a larger system that is gonna last uh, much longer uh, with these replacement parts in it. They're essentially consumables, if you will. Um, but the, many projects in the sub-regional system and not just at the plant, um, require equipment to fit in a certain area and do a specific thing and um, there are competitors who can meet certain constraints but once you do select a competitor through a competitive process which these screens the the overall screens were selected from um, you are as you clearly well understand married to that vendor and um, where wherever it's possible to uh, open up the, the options, we do, but I can guarantee that there will always be situations where you will eventually go through a competitive process and identify a vendor, but the consumable components of whatever system or equipment that you buy will require um, purchasing from that original vendor. So we would have a chance to revisit this when the screens themselves as complete units reach a point where they're at the end of the year's for life and would go through another competitive process to identify full screen replacements and that's really the opportunity to have uh, more competition and not have a sole source situation but it is a fact that once you re-enter into a relationship with a vendor for a specific thing like these screens you're you're remarried to whoever the newly selected vendor would be and honestly it's just an unfortunate reality of uh, some of the equipment that uh, we purchase um, for example, the Cummins engines that were just referenced in the last item, uh, we, we can't put GE Genbacher uh, parts on a Cummins engines for obvious reasons. When those engines are worn out, we'll have an opportunity to change vendors, but at that point, 
we would be with a new vendor and need to uh, bring items similar to this with sole source justifications. And uh, quite honestly, it's 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 not really embarrassing, but it's awkward that so much of the uh, sole source procurements uh, at the city happen in my division, the sub-regional division, for reasons related to these these complex um, vendor-specific systems that we operate. I would also like to add that, um, agreed, the systems themselves are very unique. We have a very large facility as well, I'm globally large. Um, one thing that would be able to address the, the count or the board's concerns would be as we evaluate new opportunities when units that are sole source actually reach their um, useful life end, that we push a paradigm to make sure that we have ongoing maintenance and articulate spares within at least a two to five year agreement plan. So after you've actually installed your product and, and proceeded past and it's actually in working order, that you have an understanding of articulate spares, how many you would need, and be able to hopefully push some fixed pricing in advance. Um, that varies based on industry. We're seeing a huge variability in steel right now. So we see a lot of pricing that's changing quite rapidly and we force the vendors to support those things. I would like to point out that for this specific request, there isn't an ongoing maintenance contract in order since the origination of the um, products placed in service because our staff actually are the subject matter experts and provide the ongoing maintenance. So this is a more of a useful life issue within its end. These screens, if I may add, um, are a significant departure from the prior um, Headworks equipment that we had at the plant. And it has taken time to get to know the equipment and determine rates of consumption of the consumable components of the equipment. And I think going forward, this process that you're being um, uh, presented with today, this, this item, uh, will inform when we would need to be uh, bringing additional uh, equipment procurement items to you in the future. So they, they've been installed for quite some time. I think it's uh, over 10 years or, or thereabouts. Um, uh, and it, we're still actually getting to know the equipment and the, the wear rates of certain components that haven't yet had to be replaced. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, that concludes my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Dowd. I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but just to put this in order, when you made the original selection to go with Andritz uh, Separation Inc. for the whole system, what was the cost of that system? The original cost, was, so we actually did the RFP back in 2007 and the request for proposals was specific to product only. I wanna point that out. Installation occurred through a separate major public works agreement. So the original award was for $1,060,417.60. And I would also like to add for the pleasure of the board that I did some research in, and um, prior to this meeting to understand that the current costs in 2018 for the same equipment, if we we were to just buy the units, not install them, is 1.57 million. So they've they've actually maintained a very useful life cycle cost, and ideally, I mean, this is a quite small repair if you look at the total global cost for ongoing. Yeah, that that was the purpose of my question, and we all face that. Whether you're buying a car or a refrigerator, you've got things that belong to it that are made to fit in as replacement parts, Absolutely. but they're a small part of what the whole purchase was when you bought the car. Absolutely. So I, I certainly can support this and would, would, would well, make a motion. If there's no, no further board member questions or comments, we have a resolution. Oh, is it a resolution in this case? Okay. I make a resolution of the Board of Public Utilities waiving competitive bidding and approving an award of a sole source purchase order for Aqua Screen Parts to Andritz Separation Inc. of Dallas, Texas, and waive the reading of the remainder of the text. Second. Motion by Board Member Dowd, seconded by Board Member Mullen to approve item 6.1 and the resolution. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item uh, 7.1 is a report item on our Northern Sonoma County Water Conservation Funding Agreement.
Good afternoon, Chair uh, Galvin, members of the BPU. Uh, I'm Sean McNeil with the water use efficiency team um, in the water department. And I'm here to talk to you about a funding agreement that we uh, have lucked into or, or have done great work to put ourselves in position for uh, being able to uh, take advantage of. So we're just booting up the computer. I think you can take all the credit you want. I don't think this was luck. Okay, so this uh, today I'll talk to you about this funding agreement with Sonoma Water, formerly known as uh, Sonoma County Water Agency, and I'll be using their newly adopted name throughout this presentation. Uh, before I get into the agreement, I just give a little background on uh, the city's green exchange program. We started it in 2007. It's to help us with our peak demand reduction, really take a look at our water use in the city and look at the peak time. Is there a way to shave some of that water off so that we wouldn't have to upgrade our pipes and systems to maintain our system? And the peak demand programs are really addressing that. And so in our service area, the peak demand is in summer. So so programs that address that water that's used in summer uh, have that benefit of reducing overall peak demand. Uh, and we started this program, has two components, the irrigation efficiency upgrades and our very popular cash for grass program. The cash for grass program provides rebates of 50 cents per square foot for uh, turf removed and replaced with low water use plantings. And the city has removed uh, since the beginning of this program, 3.5 million square feet of turf. And I uh, also just want to point out, since uh, 2014, we removed 1.4 million square feet. And that number is important when I get into the contract details. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And so the estimated savings since 2014 is about 25 million gallons per year. And for the whole program, we're gaining about 60 million gallons of water saved per year. So the opportunity, just to kind of dig into this opportunity, the state awarded Sonoma Water with uh, funds to help water efficiency in northern Sonoma County. We weren't a part of that grant in the original agreement. Uh, it was set up just for these northern communities. They were unable to spend all those funds in those northern communities, so they went back to the granting agency and uh, were approved to open that funding up to other entities in the watershed, including the city of Santa Rosa and that these funds would go retroactive back to any rebates back to 2014. And this was emergency drought funding. And so you'll recall those of you who are on the board then, and we were doing lots of activities throughout the drought and got a lot of people involved in our programs. And so this funding could help uh, offset some of those costs that we incurred in that time. But the city would need to enter into this funding agreement with Sonoma Water for us to access those funds. This funding agreement provides funding about 37 and a half cents per square foot of turf removed uh, and up to $116,250 of funding would be made available to the city and that our current already provided for rebates uh, would more than exceed uh, the amount needed to fully recoup uh, this full $116,000. So our staff recommendation is to approve the funding agreement to be a part of the Northern Sonoma County Water Conservation Grant Program. With that, any questions? Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Any board member questions or comments? We have one speaker card, Mr. DeWitt. 
Thank you. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, and I'm very glad you folks have been uh, working diligently to reduce landscape water needs. I'm uh, supportive of this and hope that you will uh, go forward with this. One of the things that I'm hoping is that you'll also talk with other departments within the city to get them to look at how to reduce landscape water needs. Specifically, for a number of years, I've been advocating for the conservation of natural land in Roseland. There's an area along Roseland Creek where we believe there could actually be stormwater retention basins and uh, a way of doing water efficiency with nature. So I bring this up right now because the Recreation and Parks Department has just made a proposal which they actually publicized on KRCB radio stating that they were going to put in irrigated multi-use turf at a site that we've said should just be natural in our community. And it's located next to endangered purple needle grass, something that's the state of California's grass officially and it's known to be endangered. And they have this idea that like they're going to put in some new turf out there. That's gonna be an expensive project, putting in the irrigation piping for it. As a matter of fact, the property that they just got with the help of the Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District of 2.5 acres at 1370 and 1372 Burbank Avenue, they allowed the irrigation piping to be torn out after it was purchased by the taxpayers. That's kind of a shady deal in its own self. But that property at 1400 Burbank Avenue, it's been in city ownership since the year 2010, paid for with taxpayers' money. And we really believe that this would be an excellent project, this type of activity that you're undertaking here to implement at 1400 Burbank Avenue as soon as possible and tell that Recreation and Parks Department people that we're about pulling turf out and not spending for more turf to go in, especially because outside right now, it's about, seems like it's about 80 degrees out there on the first day of November. We may be entering another one of those periods that some people call a drought. So I do hope you'll keep all this in mind and let it reflect positively on the good work that the Santa Rosa Water is doing to induce landscape water, reduce their needs, and induce the retention of natural spaces. Thank you kindly for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. DeWitt. Any further board member questions or comments? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the agreement for Northern Sonoma County Water Conservation Program between Sonoma County Water Agency and the City of Santa Rosa and authorize the chair to sign the agreement. Second. Motion by Vice Chair Arnone, seconded by Board Member Grable to approve item 7.1. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank McNeil. You. Item 7.2 is a report item on the adoption of a mitigated negative declaration regarding an approval of the acquisition of 1225 Fulton Road. I think you need to turn your microphone on. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Galvin and board members. My name is Jillian Tillis, and I'm an associate civil engineer with Transportation and Public Works. This is Jill Scott. She's a right-of-way agent with the Water Department. We also have our GHD consultant, Christine Gaspar, in the audience to help answer questions if you need. Today we are here today we're here to talk about the Fulton Road lift station project 
Um, we're gonna give you an overview of the project description. We're gonna discuss the initial study and mitigated negative declaration and provide BPU recommendations. The West College lift station was constructed in 1965 and is known to have existing operational challenges. An evaluation of the lift station was completed in March 2015 by Brown and Caldwell, which recommended long-term recommend, which recommended long-term replacement options. Um, three, location, three locations were looked at as part of the evaluation. The church site was more feasible than the other sites with more flexibility to connect to the existing system and a larger footprint for vehicle, vehicular access. The new lift station will be installed at the proposed site at 1225 Fulton Road. The existing gravity sewer main will be extended from Fulton Road to the site. From this location, the city will construct a new force main to the intersection of Fulton Road and West Third Street. Slip lining the existing force main on West College to the North Trunk Line um, as an option is another option that can be looked at during the design phase and has been included in the CEQA document. <clears throat> this is a look of the conceptual site plan for, Fulton, for the Fulton Road lift station. Um, this, this does not show the final layout. It was an initial um, plan. In the initial study and the mitigated negative, negative declaration, was prepared by GHD. No significant impacts were found. Uh, these mitigations are typically included in new construction projects. Um, such as air noise and stormwater management, pre-construction biological and cultural studies. Per CEQA requirements, the ISMND was circulated for a 30-day review period. Uh, comments from the public have been addressed and are included in the, uh, the attached document. No substantial revisions to the ISMND have been identified. For the acquisition of the property, staff met with uh, the Board of Public Utilities in closed session in January and August. Um, of this and last year, um, the board gave direction to staff on price and terms for um, the purchase of the property. Staff has successfully negotiated a purchase agreement in line with those terms and parameters which are given by BPU in closed session, and staff is now seeking final approval to complete the purchase for the future lift station. We are recommending that you adopt the mitigated negative declaration and the mitigation monitoring plan, approve the project, and approve the acquisition of the 1225 Fulton Road property. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any board member questions or comments? Board member Mullen. Um, thank you. Um, Re reviewing the um, environmental document, uh, specifically the, the comments, there were some comments from the uh, some of the residents in the mobile home park 
adjacent to the proposed location for the pump station. And if you look at one of your maps in your, your presentation, it's literally a stone's throw from some of the existing homes there. Did, was there any, as a part of the, the preparation of this document, was there any uh, uh, presentation or outreach specifically to the mobile home population at this location to try to educate them about what's gonna happen and what the impacts would be both during construction and then once the site was up and running? We did the typical outreach that we do for for CIP projects. The notice of intent was mailed to all of the residents within 300 feet of the project. Um, we have, as I've spoken to people who have called to me, I have um, reminded them that this this is not um, the pro the design has not begun, and more outreach to the neighbors will be made during the design process to help uh, refine the help refine um, their con bring their concerns and their uh, recommendations into our project. Um, I, I let them know that that we plan to be reaching out to them in the future. Uh, thank you for that. And then um, secondly is the, the existing site that, that we're proposing to build on is currently occupied by the, the church and uh, there's some other uses there. And so if we move forward with this today and, and certify the, the document and move forward, um, there is a, um, is the, the city uh, and the department going to um, work with the residents there on the, the church site uh, and the uses there to make sure they understand our schedule and what our plan is so that they can, um, so that nobody's surprised by the fact that when we start rolling in there to do work, because once we take title to this property and move forward, we have a timeline. And um, so we, we need to have a site that we can come in and do our work and secure and everything else that we do when we're, we do major projects like this. But all the players and the people involved with the existing site now, the church and the community garden and those others, that everybody understands what our end goal is and uh, they understand what our timeline is and there isn't that any last minute surprises about I didn't know you were starting on Monday. The city will be working with the church as well as noticing and letting anyone uh, know that has access currently um, of what the timeline is for the city to, to take possession of the property. Um, so hopefully there will not be any surprises. Okay, thank you. Any other board member questions or comments? If not, we have a resolution. I'll move. I'll move the resolution of the Board of Public Utilities adopting a mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring program and approving the acquisition of 1552 Fulton Road, Santa Rosa for the Fulton Road sewer lift station and waive the reading of the text. I think it's 1225 yes. Fulton oh, Road. I spoke dyslexically, excuse me, 1225. I second that motion. Thank you. Motion by Vice Chair Anoni, seconded by Board Member Dowd to approve item 7.2. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes unanimously, thank you. Item number eight is public comments on non-agenda matters. Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland and I've come today because I wanted to see if the city would reach out and help to get even more funding from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Brownfields Revitalization in the Roseland area. Three years ago, at this time of the year, I was helping the Sonoma County Community Development Commission to write a grant to the US EPA. It ultimately was successful and $392,000 was given to the county, which is currently in use with a firm called Stan Tech Consulting to look into 15 parcels along Roberts Avenue, which is right adjacent to the Smart Rail Line and right near Highway 12's overpass going to the west. It is close to the 
Highway 101 intersection. And the reason I come here is because there's opportunities for the city, now that it's been annexed, and that area is in the city, for you folks to ask for up to millions of dollars in grant funding and what's called area-wide community planning grants to help Brownfield's revitalization. This is the real tip of a positive spear into uh, activities that are inter-jurisdictional. The thing of it is, is you need to have a lead agency. The city manager's office is very busy planning and economic development. They're already stretched thin. But this is about water, essentially, because how those areas became brownfields was because a leaking sanitary sewage system contaminated the underground aquifer all the way from, uh, it's called Boyd Street, next to the rail line. That's where the old Point St. George's fishery was. It goes underneath uh, Timothy Street, Goodman Avenue, Avalon, West Avenue. Uh, McMinn Avenue is the street I grew up on, and it was actually considered the site of a state super fund back in 1984. So that's been cleared, but the opportunities are still there because not much has really been done in that area to revitalize it and repair it. So I'll just leave you with this note. Tonight at six o'clock at Finley Center, the city subcommittee on the Open Government Task Force is meeting. And when I came earlier today, I didn't know the specifics about the one o'clock special session. There are no, no agendas were up here for it, so I had to go ask for one. I arrived a little bit late. And it specifically was about negotiating for the properties of the Lutheran Church, which you're now just been talking about on Fulton Road also. I'm hoping that in the future, you folks will adopt the city's idea that they're going to go with a more open government and they're going to share information with people in a forthright manner early on in processes. It can be a positive thing. City staff are typically risk averse. They don't want to have anything get in the way and they don't want to be considered at fault for something such as that equipment you just talked about over at the uh, digester gas implementation. So I'm just basically a person who comes here and can occasionally make time to get this information because I work evenings and weekends. The average Joe or Jane can't get down here during the work day. And yet you folks spend millions upon millions of dollars of ratepayers' money, and that would interest a lot of people in a positive way. Many people in this community are conservationists and environmentalists, and they want to see some of the good things that come forward. You actually have heaven on earth in the department here. And I like hearing the good things that come forward when we're doing water conservation, nature conservation, and things of that, um, that ilk. So I'll leave you with this. I have a copy of Santa Rosa Sustainable Education Garden pamphlet for out front when they took out that water wasting lawn. And also, you guys had the uh, 50th anniversary celebration out at the plant and you, you gave away water bottles to people. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good thing. We could be doing that. So I'm hoping that you folks will take this adherence to nature conservation types approaches and go forward out there in Roseland where there's some nature could still be saved and redevelop those areas that are brownfields utilizing some federal funding, and that has shown in Emeryville to have brought in 10 to 12 times the amount of the initial funding. Emeryville went from being just a little hack kind of truck stop along the Bay Bridge to now one of the most prosperous communities per capita of any in Northern California. That could happen right here in Roseland, just less than a half a mile away from here. If you folks have the foresight, please do have the foresight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. We have no referrals. We have one written communication. Any subcommittee reports? Any board member reports? Board comment. Board member Grable. Um, yeah, I had a board member comment as well, but um, we had a meeting of the Ag, Ag Water Ad Hoc uh, Subcommittee and uh, 
we reviewed for the criteria for setting uh, ag water rates, um, and it was it was productive and and you know nothing has has, has materialized uh, that is set in stone out of that committee uh, as of yet, but it is moving forward, and the um, many of the ag water rate payers slash customers were uh, in attendance at the meeting and that was that was very helpful um, to make sure we were sort of entering this process in good faith and really taking into account uh, all the concerns the criteria the contingencies that we uh, that we need to have available um, and, and all the different factors at play and so the next five or ten years that we can that we can see or foresee so and if uh, Board member, I know you had anything to add that I missed. I, I would just second your, your comments. Uh, uh, board member Battencourt, board member Grable and I were both, uh, all three in attendance at this meeting with the ag community. We had uh, users of the recycled water uh, voicing their concerns and we had a product, uh, presentation from uh, Mr. Reed uh, concerning different approaches to um, handling the, uh, trying to gain some uniformity in the pricing of of recycled water, uh, so it was all in all a, an ex a helpful exchange of information, and I think uh, we're trying to hear all voices that have an interest in this. And I thought it was a productive meeting, and I, I believe there are more on the on the books. Uh, so we keep moving forward and trying to achieve that uh, that uniformity of rate structure and fairness to all the parties concerned. Great, thank you for your participation, all three of you, in the ad hoc committee. Any other board member reports? Director's report. Chair Galvin, I do have a few items to provide update on. This past Saturday, October 27th, Santa Rosa Water participated in the Science Discovery Day held at Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. Science Discovery Day is held annually around the Bay Area to engage with students about everything STEM related. Santa Rosa Water, Water facilitated an interactive hands-on exhibit featuring pH testing. Thousands attended the event and over 500 young students and their families participated in the Santa Rosa Water exhibit. It was a wonderful event and many of our staff participated. The, the second item I had was, is in 2017, the governor of California signed into law Assembly Bill 746, requiring water systems in California to test the water for lead at all K through 12 public schools that the public water system serves. Although lead is rarely found in California drinking water sources, including it, ours, water passing through older plumbing fixtures and old pipes can be exposed to lead with potentially some leaching out over time. The city is required to comply with a lead and copper rule, which has been in place for quite some time, which requires us to test for lead in the drinking water system, but it does not apply to schools. So schools have not been tested in this broad manner that this new bill requires. This week, the water department sent letters to all 50 schools that are required to be tested, as well as the school districts informing them of the requirements. We'll be working with the schools to develop a sampling plan. We'll sample water from certain fixtures and have the samples analyzed at no cost to the schools. This testing is required to be completed before July 1st, 2019, and the results will be provided to the school and to the State Division of Drinking Water. The final item I have to share today, um, it's a little difficult, but um, it, it's, it's also a bit celebratory. Um, Mike Prince has um, announced his departure from the uh, city of Santa Rosa. He has been with us since March 25th, 2002, and he's focused specifically on water projects and operations since that date. He was hired on as an associate engineer as part of the original utilities CIP team that was formed just prior to his hire and is still in existence today. Mike took the helm of the CIP team when he promoted up to supervising engineer in 2006. 
and he took a deep interest in sub-regional capital projects, which eventually led him to promote into the deputy director position, which he is now in 2012. During his tenure, Mike personally managed nearly 50 water and wastewater projects and championed a whole number of programs. And I did roam the halls a little bit this morning, asking folks kind of highlights of projects that Mike was involved in. I finally had to just shut it off because I ran out of space. But um, so some of the highlights, the uh, Proctor tanks water storage, the Proctor Heights water storage tanks, as well as a whole number of other water storage um, tank construction projects, including a phase of the seismic upgrades, the Summerfield Road water transmission main, the North Trunk sewer um, through the Sonoma County Ag, and it was a complex project, the combined heat and power project that we were touching on earlier today, a whole number of initiatives, the emergency groundwater program and test borings throughout the city, AquaZone water um, storage tank siting study, of course the LTP disinfection upgrade alternative analysis that's still um, just about over the finish line. The high strength program that he championed that the city's gonna benefit for years to come. And in fact, the microgrid project that we were talking about today is also leading the effort um, for the um, co-location of the um, organics processing facility that we've been talking about and will continue to work on. And um, he was also an, an incident commander during the fire and um, so much value over the years to the the city, Mike. Um, would you care to uh, come up and share any thoughts you may have, Mike? If the board doesn't mind, I'd like to change the feng shui a little bit and just stand while I make a few comments. Um, there's, there's one less thing between us if I stand here as opposed to sit down. Um, this is probably the last time I'll speak in front of the board as an employee of Santa Rosa Water. Um, my last day actually is the 15th of November, which is another BPU meeting, and I'll attend that. I may not make it all the way to the end, though, because I need to get to another board meeting, and that is a board meeting of the organization that I'm going to be working for, which is the Las Colinas Valley Sanitary District uh, in Northern San Rafael. I've accepted a position there as a general manager and I'm extremely excited about that. It's a little bittersweet though because after having worked at Santa Rosa um, for as long as I have, um, I've got a lot of memories and uh, developed a lot of relationships. I am who I am today as far as a water industry professional and I've accomplished what I've accomplished while working for Santa Rosa um, because of a long list of people. And uh, I need a couple of minutes, and I need to list some names of some people. Uh, many of you may know a lot of these people, but these are important people to me. I've had a lot of experiences with them. Um, we've worked through some tough issues, and I've had some great experiences and accomplished a lot because of these people. And I want to I name them here. Like me, I'm imperfect. I'm sure this list is imperfect. I'm sure I'm gonna uh, catch some names later that I will deeply regret having missed. Um, so I'm just gonna apologize up front by saying that. But um, there's a long list of staff members who I wanna mention. Some of them are working for Santa Rosa today. Some have retired. Dave Keck, Dan Carlson, Linda Reed, Glenn Wright, Bob Harder, Miles Ferris, Greg Scholes, Terry Schimmel, Joe Schwal, Jason Bishop, Mike Sherman, Zach Kay, David Ewan, Jennifer Piccinini, Russ Harlan, Tracy Duanis, Tanya Mokovitz, Anna McAuliffe, Peter Dodsworth, Dennis Mays, Walt Olowski, Rob Sprinkle, Jennifer Burke, Rita Miller, Norman Amadon, Roberta Atha, Annette Townley, Amy Brennan, Lauren Curiel, Karen Weeks, Ron Marinchek, Rick Santorini, Gina Perez, Jill Scott, Mike Casey, John Fritch, Rob Jackson, Molly McLean, and Suzanne Rawlings. Um, there are some public officials that I've got uh, experience with and I want to acknowledge here as well. John Sawyer, Dick Dowd, uh, T.J. Lowe, Dan Galvin, and Robin Swinth. 
a lot, being an engineer, I deal with a lot of uh, consultants. And without consultants, Santa Rosa Water and other Santa Rosa departments wouldn't, wouldn't accomplish what we do accomplish. So there's some consultants I wanna list, and I'm not gonna list the companies they work for. Maybe that would be a, an endorsement that Molly would have a word with me later about. So I'm not gonna mention their companies, but there are some individuals. And really when it comes down to it, one of the things I've learned is that it's about the individuals that we work with, not the companies that they work for. Many of these individuals, um, if they worked for a different company, would be um, just as useful and valuable to the city. So I think their names matter more than anything. Um, Rich Ingram, David Long, Tom Yakoy, Mike Janet, Liz Ellis, Mike West, Jane Rosga, Andy Salveson, Mark Solomon, Adam Ross, Kenny Klittich, Denny Parker, Linda Sawyer, Ted Witten, Pat Collins, Andy Rogers, Don Taffler, John Cronin, Tom Gorman, Dave Smith, and Scott Reynolds, who has now passed. Um, being an engineer, designing things, and seeing them constructed means contractors also play a role. And I've worked with a number of contractors, and some I, I think it's fitting to mention here as well, and I'm gonna do that. Um, Mark Bushnell, Rob Lee, Tom Woosley, Bob Stiles, James Piazza, and Lee Smith, who has also now passed. Um, Maybe more importantly than all those names, which in themselves are very important to me, is uh, rate payers paid me for the work that I did for Santa Rosa. And to each and every rate payer who has uh, paid a water and sewer bill and in one way or another contributed to my salary and helped me uh, fund all my life's expenses and my mortgage and the whole nine yards, uh, I thank all the rate payers who paid their, their fees. So that's really all I have to say. Well, Mike, I think it goes without saying that we're gonna sorely miss you and your presentations here at the board meetings. Board meetings might be a little um, shorter, no? <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. We wish you all the best in your new position. I, uh, the new district is obviously getting a quality general manager, and I'm sure you'll do an excellent job there, and hopefully you won't be a stranger for us. So much good luck to you. Any other board member comments or questions? I, I would like to, Chairman Galvin. Um, I, I ditto what you just said in your comments, but I also want you to know, uh, Mr. Prince, that you are not only a very valuable employee of the Water Department and an associate during my term as a member of this board, but I also consider you a friend and I wish you the best of good luck. Board Member Grable. Yeah, I would, I would echo those comments. In my in my short time on the board, I value your expertise, but also your sense of humor, and whether it's here at the dais or at the toad in the hole, you know. Um, but I can't express enough the, the gratitude, I think, that, that we all share. And that was gonna actually be part of my broader comment was that, you know, some of these meetings can be so exhausting and we dig into the weeds and we and we get into the minutia and, and what I was gonna say on that is, I mean, it's our duty to serve the public and the planet and, and, and really, and take care of the department. And as part of doing that, I think it's, it requires that we are extremely thoughtful, critical, crossing our T's, going back over things. It, it, and that can be so exhausting, it can feel like we're being critical of each other, like we're not respecting the time and the work and the expertise that got, has gone into that. But I think at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to do that. But I also think it's our responsibility to protect our ratepayers by expressing gratitude and respect to our staff to retain or <laughs> you know, respect those that, that uh, that obviously are very skilled and, and, and do move on. That's just the nature of, of any agency. But I think the, the value of gratitude and cultivating that, um, that sense of um, trust in, in each other's expertise and mission is just so important to the longevity of our mission to the public and the planet. So, and, and you've shown more than, you know, more than a lot of folks how, uh, 
how difficult and uh, you know how much expertise and diligence is required to to achieve that. So just thank you so much. Vice Chair Anoni. Okay, I, I got to say a couple words. First of all, one of the first things I remember about being on this board was uh, having a, a tour of the treatment plant, and that was right after Mike had uh, assumed leadership role. And and the two things that remember that, I, that stick out in my memory about that uh, opportunity to visit the treatment plant were number one, your enthusiasm about. Uh, how this was your dream job and how, now I'm a little disappointed to hear you're moving on since it was your dream job, but but, it, but you did express that and then you proceeded to demonstrate that by taking me on a tour where we virtually ran around the entire treatment plan so that by the time of the, I was at the end of the tour, I was completely out of breath, but I knew a lot more about the treatment plan. So thank you very much and best wishes in the future. <laughs> Remember Mullen. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I've only been on the board a short period of time, and, and I also got the, the tour from uh, from Mike, and I've never seen anyone so excited about talking about the wastewater treatment process step by step. Um, and uh, so, and I appreciate his sense of humor as well. Uh, one of the few engineers I've dealt with in, in my uh, career that uh, speaks common English to a non-engineer, which is not always easy for them to do. Um, but I always appreciate the fact that he spoke with such confidence in, in the stuff that he was responsible for, and it makes it real easy as a decision maker, which we are, to uh, have faith and confidence in the projects and the work that you would bring forward to get behind it, because uh, it, you could tell that you had done all your due diligence and your commitment and your staff reflects all that. Listening to your list of people that have uh, impacted you in your career, it's real easy to see how you've reached the heights that you have, because that's quite a list of people, um, and you should be proud of that and proud of your, your fingerprints on so many things here uh, that will live on for quite some time. So I wish you all the best. Member Bannister. Well, Mike, uh, being the newest board member, I haven't had the opportunities that the others have to work with you and to have this tour now. Maybe I'll have it within the next two weeks before you leave. I don't know. Uh, can we reschedule? Uh, <laughs> if I don't, um, I, I know I'll have missed something and I'll miss working with you, um, but I've known you from before I was on this board and, and can certainly uh, agree with all of them about your expertise. and and easygoing nature. So good luck in your new position. Assistant City Attorney McLean. Thank you, Chair, for the indulgence, since I'm one of the few employees that gets to have a microphone up here. I, I just want to say congratulations. I have had the distinct pleasure of working with, with Mike Prince for just about my entire time here at the city. Um, I've never found someone, especially an engineer, who so appreciates my, my letter writing as Mike. Thank you. Um, and it's been a, a very enjoyable working with you. I have learned a lot from you, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Very good. Well, much good luck to you. Um, I will be m missing at the la next meeting on the 15th, so Vice Chair Arnone will be running the meeting. And because of that, I wish you all a very wet November and happy Thanksgiving to you and your families. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>